Why, hello there, and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Sandy Alnock. I'm an artist, and today I'm going to be talking about watercolor and my overhaul of my palette for 2024. Now, I'm not talking about the physical palette. This is still my 18 color palette from House of Hoffman. It's the colors in it that have changed pretty radically. I've swapped out eight out of 18. That's almost half of my colors are new for 2024. A little bit dangerous, but it's been a long time coming. Now, how do I know it's time to change out the palette? If you start noticing that you have not refilled particular wells of color very often, whereas you've refilled the others quite often, maybe, just maybe, that color is not carrying its weight. And I have a number of colors in my palette that are not. And there's also some things I wanted to fit into my palette, a particular kind of yellow, and I needed to get rid of something else to do that. So different colors got voted off the island. Sorry to them. There are two things I want to ask of you before I get started. One is don't be that person on pretty much every palette video who feels the need to say, oh, that's a terrible choice. Why did you put that color in your palette? A person's choices are a person's choices. The best recommendation I can make is to subscribe to that person's channel and watch what they paint with that color. You might learn something that that is actually a good color in certain uses or certain combinations, which is a reminder you might want to subscribe to this one because I have eight crazy colors coming. The second thing I would like your help on is getting some suggested color combinations. One of them should be one of the new colors, and then the other ones can be whatever colors you think you'd like to see with it. And then I'll do a series of paintings in the next month or two with different color combinations, focusing on each one of my new colors. So I can explain more than I am in this video in depth, what I see in it, what I wanna explore with it, and then create a painting with it as well. So leave your suggestions in the comments down below. So giving you that heads up before we get started, in case you need pencil and paper. At the end of this video, I'd like to share a few tips on how you can develop your own palette, as well as how your palette helps to develop your voice as an artist. So hang around for that. Let's get started swatching. Whenever I refer to the big palette, that means this House of Hoffman palette. And I have it set up so it's yellows, then reds, a brown, some blues, greens, and then more neutral colors, uh, including my Payne's Blue Gray, which you see a lot of times around here. But I am going to be swatching out this palette, and I took the colors that I'm removing and put them in a row above, just for my own record, so I remember what came out. Let's begin with the yellows. I have kicked, sadly, Oriolan to the curb, and I wanted to replace it with something special, and so I was trying to vote one off the island. The two that stayed are Hansa Yellow Light and New Gamboche. A warm and a cool. These two colors mix well with my blues and my greens to make all different kinds of greens for my landscapes, and I also can mix them with the reds to get oranges. Lots of different things I can do when I have a cool and a warm in the palette. So definitely have a cool and a warm yellow. The yellow that I ended up switching to was going to be Nickel Azo. You might know my love of Nickel Azo and the bursting things that it does, but the base color is kind of poopy. This one is Indian yellow and it has a nicer base color to it, but it has some of the same bursting types of things that it does. And I was excited to see that. So I'm going to be playing with it in lots of different ways in the future. I want to do a whole video just on that color to talk about it more. And then this is my, you know, my same old yellow ochre. I always have yellow ochre in my palettes. Here's some of the yellow tests that I had done. And you can see there's a value difference in a couple of the yellows, but the Indian yellow and the nickel azo have more value difference. So I can get a little more color if I use heavier pigmentation. And the color, the base color for Indian yellow is just much nicer 
and I, I don't like and wouldn't paint with nickel azo on its own, but I would use the Indian yellow. So this one is an Indian yellow couple of tulips. You can see the slight difference you can get from that, and you can force that to be much stronger. Same with these yellow flowers. The other ones I had to work really, really hard to try to get the paint thick enough to do what um, Indian yellow can do naturally. So that's why I chose it. I made a pretty big shift in my reds. I've had anthraquinoid scarlet in my palette for eons and decided it would go, as well as permanent alizarin crimson. And the permanent alizarin crimson was just never a go-to for whatever reason. Even though I know it mixes with certain things to make certain colors, it just was not a color that I was drawn to. So I evicted it and replaced it with pyrrole crimson. We'll see if that does me any better because there were some things that I liked in my tests that, you know, maybe it will draw my attention more. And keeping my quinacridone rose, you know, for those soft pinks and, and flowers, that sort of thing, need to have a little bit of that bright color. But the color that's going to sit in between them instead of anthraquinoid is permanent red deep. Now, both of these new reds are medium staining, which makes me nervous because I don't like having this many staining colors in my palette. But the things that it did on the paper were quite exciting to me because I've never been happy with a painting of a rose necessarily, a red rose with any of the colors I've ever painted because they just looked kind of dead. The color just dries a little bit dead. And that is, by the way, my transparent red oxide, which sits next to the reds. And uh, it, it sits right in that spot for a particular reason that I'll tell you about in a minute. But the red tests that I did, you can see a bit of a difference, and probably more in reality than in video. Um, the one on the right is the new colors, and it's just brighter colors. Um, the roses that I painted there are with the new reds, whereas... I get a little bit warmer color and a little deader color with the anthraquinoid. And then as soon as I switched over to the permanent red deep with the pyrrole crimson, I was just much happier with that. And I'm going to have to paint some roses and see how I like it. It does mix to be a really dark, which is one of the things I used to use alizarin crimson for the few times I did use it. So still have that. My blues had a complete overhaul and an addition. So starting off with cobalt blue coming out and French ultramarine coming in, partially because I had three tubes for some reason of French ultramarine in my box and nothing in the cobalt. So I'm going to try it. A lot of artists will use this for mixing their neutrals with a brown. And I'm going to try it and see and use up this paint that's here. And the uh, next color is duochrome cabo blue, which is one of those colors that has some shimmer to it. And using it thickly, it will do that. But you can also drop it into some really rich dark colors when making, say, a galaxy. And it'll burst out in similar ways that Indian yellow will do. And I'll be showing you that in coming weeks. The color that I'm replacing cobalt blue with, some of the things I liked cobalt for, is verditer blue. It's such a traditional blue. Like, look at that blue. Look at that bird. It is the perfect blue for that. There's a lot of things that Verditer Blue does gorgeously. Like, look at this sky. I just put, painted water in there and then dropped color in. I love this color. It's got a little bit of granulation to it, but it's just really, really nice. So here's using my different blues together. I wanted to see how they'd work together. That kind of glowing blue is the dual chrome cabo blue. On the edges, you see some of that bright verditer goes into some of the ultramarine, and then the ultramarine goes in here in the, the darkest parts with some Payne's blue gray. I like these colors. I'm wanting to paint more seascapes and waves because all of my ocean paintings sold in 2023, so that is a sign. Maybe I should do more. And then there was some other testing of colors. I was mixing everything with all the different colors on my palette. I also did a lot of tests in reality to see what a sky looks like in all the different blues that I was considering. There were some that had just some issues 
in the the painting, the physical painting. Um, I don't like the mess that I feel like I get with cobalt teal blue. I love the color, but the granulation just feels messy in a painting. But King's Royal Blue is a lovely color. I liked it a lot, but it just has these spots where the pigment collects and I could not seem to paint with without doing that. So that's where Verditer Blue came in and rescued me. Cerulean Blue is beautiful and I can get some lovely edges, but it just has, again, ridiculous amounts of granulation. It's not something that I enjoy in my paintings and who knows, maybe I'll change my mind someday, but that's kind of how I test in real life situations rather than squares of color. Two greens got voted off the island and one was green gold because I can mix sap with a yellow to get a green gold. And the other was green appetite, which has not seen much use. And if it hasn't seen much use lately, it's time for it to make room for something else on my palette. I'm keeping two staple greens, cascade green and sap green. One is more of a blue green and the other is more of a traditional green. And I know there are artists who hate these two colors because they're just so quote unquote boring. But I just want to tell you, if a color works for you, if it mixes well with the other colors you use, just use it. Ignore those people who tell you something is a, you know, a terrible color or whatever. Okay. Ultramarine turquoise. I'm going to talk a little bit more about and show you a little demo in just a minute. This chromium green oxide or chromium oxide green. I can never remember exactly what it's called, but this color is opaque. I have no opaque colors in my palette, but it's got some really fun things that I want to explore with it. Lots of this chromium oxide color is in the landscapes I'm going to show you. The, these greens, which are kind of dull and yet lifelike. I mean, they, they just look more realistic to me. This one has a lot of the chromium green in it mixed with some yellows to get those brighter colors. And then the mid-tones are almost the, the chromium green by itself. And there's just something about the light that I can capture with this color and the way it mixes with other things that I'm really interested to see how it works. I don't know what I'm going to do with its opacity. That's just something I'm going to need to play with and explore. This one also has a bunch of that chromium oxide in it. The wash across the grasses has a little bit of yellow in it, and it's just a real thin wash. But back there in that center portion and that hillside is more of what that color looks and feels like. Uh, just really, really interesting. The grasses here in the foreground also has some, some of the chromium oxide mixed in it. And I just like how it's kind of a tamped down green. The opposite of uh, tamped down color is ultramarine turquoise. Really bright, really strong. And I wanted to see what the range was. How light will it go? How dark will it go? And it gets pretty intense, but it's not a staining color. I like that about it. It's got a bit of granulation to it, just a wee bit. And it's more greenish than my phthalo blue turquoise. So I get a little bit more of a turquoise flavor rather than the blue turquoise felt very blue. This one has a really great variety in terms of going from really light to really dark. So I like having that option. It mixes really nicely with my Verditer blue to give me that under color in the wave, that, that kind of deep turquoise. And then it gets even deeper when I mix that in with some of the ultramarine blue or a little bit of Payne's blue gray to just deepen those colors. I like the way that these play together. So that's something I wanna explore, but I'm open to other turquoises because I tried a few others and this one for right now has my attention. I just wanna give it a try for a while and do some more of these seascapes and see what happens, see what I can create in terms of color using it. The last section of my palette is not new colors, but I'm calling them heroes. Could have been miscellaneous, but I'm gonna call them heroes to show them some love. One is Payne's Blue Gray, which serves as a black for me. I don't like using regular old black in a palette, really. And I can mix that to be a black if I need one. And the other two in this section are Lunar Blue, which is a beautiful color, as is Moon Glow. Both of those colors are highly granulating. They're, I consider them specialty colors. I don't use them in a lot of my day-to-day -day stuff. 
But I've done entire paintings in those two colors and they're like value studies because they go from super, super light and bright to deep, dark, almost black. These hero colors look just about the same on a swatch sheet. Like there's very little difference between them. They're really different paints and they perform completely differently. That's why I never trust swatch sheets like this. I made this just for you for this video. I like to actually paint in context to make sure that the paint is going to do what I want it to do. When I was painting all of those sample paintings, I was testing to see how does it drop into water? What happens when I drop it into wet pigment? What happens when I drop it into thin wet pigment versus thick wet pigment? I mean, I'm looking for lots of different things out of my paints, but just making a block of color doesn't really help in deciding what's going to be in my main palette. I want things that are going to have certain properties in them. And one of the things I was looking for in a lot of my paints is having a value range. And I was testing out value range because that's important to me. Something else might be important to you. And I recommend that you actually paint in context because that's going to help you to see what your colors are going to do when you actually paint with them. Now, why do you need a curated palette or a main palette? Not your 60 well palette, not your 48 well palette, not your 36 well palette. I mean a 12 to 18 color palette. And for the truly needy, you can go up to 24, but please limit your colors. As an artist, you need to have a set of colors that you will grow with. As long as you have 17 different greens to choose from, you will never be forced to try to mix the right green that you need for that painting at that moment. And I know it might sound like eating your vegetables, but I really believe you need to learn color mixing, even just simple color mixing, using a simpler set of colors. A warm and a cool in each of the primary colors as your basis. Start with that and grow from there. Add yourself some treats, some of your favorite colors or your, your colors that have particular properties. And then work with those things for six months, a year. Stay with those colors for a while. Then as you find that there's certain colors you're not using or certain colors you're always reaching out to that extra palette for, then you can add those in and get rid of something you haven't used. There's another side benefit that I discovered when I switched to having a smaller main palette, and you may find it as well, which is that I started seeing more commonality in my work and my voice as an artist has started to develop. I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived, but I'm starting to see those common things that make my work mine. And a lot of it is because I have curated my colors. They express me as an artist. Your colors will express you as an artist. So when you make those choices, it's going to affect your work. I'm a little scared about the color choices that I've made. And am I going to undo any learning that I've already had about who I am as an artist? I have no idea, but I'm going to find out. The only way to find out is to try it. So hopefully you'll stick around with me on this journey and maybe together we'll discover what our voice is as an artist and how to even take steps toward that. Thank you so much for visiting with me. I will see you again when I'm going to show you all of the new Daniel Smith gouache colors. So a little more swatching coming, a little more painting coming. I will see you then. Don't forget to add your three color combinations in the comments and I'll see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye.